So I spent this time at the beginning to say what's not the purpose. But then we have obviously this question before us, well, what is the purpose then? And the purpose is this. God gives us this genealogy to continue his story. He's making a theological point. He's displaying the line of descent here, the seed of promise, and he's saying, I am faithful to my promise. The seed is continuing. And yet there's a complication to that. Because other than the ages of these men, something that we pick up on, obviously, what what jumps out at you from this passage? As you look at this passage, as you particularly heard it read, what, what jumps out at you? Well, probably it was this little phrase. Hopefully, in fact, it was. It it should jump out at the reading of the the text. And he died. And he died. Those three little words, again and again we heard them. And he died. Adam died. Seth died. Enosh died. And so on. That's what should jump out at us. So God is showing us also that death is a reality in the post-fall world. So that's the problem of our text. That's the problem of this chapter in Scripture. And that gets even more clear when we look at the context of this genealogy. So it's always good to look at whatever Scripture passage you're looking at and then move out to the passages around it. And so as we particularly look at Genesis 4 again, that we saw last week, Genesis 4 is the context for Genesis 5. And Genesis 4 describes life after the fall, right? That's what, we, that's what we've been seeing. The falls in chapter 3. And then we see what normal life looked like after that. But what's the one thing that characterizes that life more than anything, at least as it's presented in chapter 4? What's the one thing that's most characteristic of that chapter? It's death. Again, it's death. Now, I told you that this is going to be comforting, that I'm going to be providing hope. And perhaps you're thinking, well, talk of death, that's not very comforting. Well, we'll get there. We'll get there. But first, we have to see the death that was present in this world. We see in chapter 4, Cain's murder of Abel. We also hear of other murders. We hear of the the threat of murders. Cain is afraid of being killed. Remember, he speaks with God about that. But there's also Lamech who boasts of the killing that he has done. And so we could say that as we look at chapter 4, mankind is on this path to death. And also, too, it's good to note, important for us this morning to see that there's a genealogy in chapter 4 as well. If you look at chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. Verses 17 and 18, we have the genealogy that shows the ungodly line of descent, the seed of the serpent. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Erad, and Erad begot Mahujael, and Mahujael begot Methushel, and Methushel begot Lamech. You can see some of the similarities with the names, but, but there is a genealogy. And as we compare that to chapter 5, what do we notice? Well, there's no ages, there's no numbers. It begins with Cain, it ends with Lamech. And as we consider that, that it goes from Cain to Lamech, Cain is this man who murdered his brother. And then Lamech is this man who, he was a wicked man. He was a disastrous man, really. And he boasts of killing others as well. And then as we look ahead, especially if you know your Bibles, you know what's coming in the next few chapters, the flood, we're going to see that this line is wiped out, that only the other line survives. But this line, this genealogy stops. And so death is throughout this part of the story. And yet then we go to chapter 5, and and we make this comparison with chapter 5, and here we see life. It's not all about death. Chapter 5 is where the good news is, where the gospel is. Good news for Israel. Israel, who's the original audience of this chapter. Israel, who's surrounded by death. But also good news for us, because we're surrounded by death as well. We see disease all over the place. Perhaps we've experienced it personally. We see violence, both near and far. We see the world wearing out. We see decay everywhere. We're surrounded by death. And so the life that's revealed in this chapter 
provides us with comfort and hope. And you say life, but pastor, it says, and he died. It says that again and again. There's, there's still death all over this chapter. What, what do you mean life? Well, let's look at verses 1 and 2 together. Verses 1 and 2, this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. And having just read through Genesis, you hear that and you think, well, that's kind of repetitive. We already know that. The Israelites already knew that. That's just referring back to creation. But you see, that's the point. Moses, as he's writing this, the Israelites, as they're hearing this, are meant to come back to creation. And it's a reminder that God has created the people for a purpose. God has created everything for a purpose. He has a program, we could say. He has an agenda. And what is that? It's life. Not death, but life. God is pro-life. God, God made the first man and woman, and he created them beautifully. He created them in his image. And then he placed them in this garden, this garden which was lush, which had abundance. And then he, he created all these creatures as well and, and vegetation, and we see the diversity, the richness, and all that. The world was teeming with life. It was full of life. God is pro-life. And then, of course, at the end of chapter 3, too, we were introduced to that tree, the tree of life. The tree of life that symbolized eternal life, the life that was held out to Adam upon his obedience, the glorious life. And you see, that's all creation, and that's all in the background then of verses 1 and 2 of the beginning of this genealogy. That's being rehearsed for the reader. And so, this, these verses, especially then along with verse 3, where Adam, we're told, begot a son in his own likeness after his image, is supposed to communicate to the reader that God is continuing his program of life and he's doing so through the line of Seth. Continuing his program. Life is still there. Seth is made in his likeness of Adam, that is, after his image. This is Adam was created in the image of after the likeness of God. And so the seed of the woman belongs to God. God is continuing his work in them, and so there is hope, hope for life after death. And we see this contrast between the seeds, uh, the death to the seed of the serpent and the hope of life to the seed of the woman. We see this illustrated in the two Lamechs. You notice there's these two men named Lamech, one in each chapter, chapter 4 and 5. And we looked at Lamech in chapter 4 quite a bit last week. He was an ungodly man. But then we look at the Lamech in chapter 5, the Lamech in the line of Seth, and he is a godly man. The first Lamech was boastful, and he was godlike. He, he, he viewed himself as God. He was the one with power and authority. Yet this Lamech in chapter 5 is humble. And he's looking to God for answers. You see that in verses 28 and 29. Verses 28, 29, overlooked verses, I think, in this chapter. Most people, again, either focus on the numbers or they focus on Enoch, which we'll get to in just a moment. But, but these are underappreciated words. They're beautiful words of Lamech. Verse 28, Lamech lived 182 years and had a son. And he called his name Noah, saying... This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord had cursed. See, he refers there to the ground that has been cursed at the end. He's alluding to that curse which we read of from Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. But, but Lamech treasures the promise of Genesis 3.15. That promise of the seed who would bring about blessing. And because he treasures that, brothers and sisters, he names his son Noah. Noah, which means rest, can also mean comfort. You see, Lamech is putting his trust in God. That's what he's doing. So important that we see that. Lamech's putting his trust in God. And then Noah will indeed bring comfort. We're going to see that in future weeks as we move through these chapters here. That Noah is a righteous man. Not perfect, but righteous. 
who found favor in the eyes of the Lord, we're told in chapter 6, who was obedient to God's command to build an ark. And that ark was then used by God to bring salvation to the people from those flood waters. And so comfort does come through the seed of the woman. And so the Lamex, I hope you see our study in contrast. But there's one more contrast in our text. It's a big one. It's the contrast between the seventh from Adam on each side. And now again, thinking back to how numbers function, that symbolism of the numbers. Number seven, we know in this Bible, is so uh, important to, to symbolize the divine fullness, divine completeness. Remember the purpose of this genealogy, it, it is selective, so it's teaching us something about God and about his people. And so we think of the seventh from Adam in Cain's line. Who is that? The seventh from Adam in Cain's line. It's Lamech. And Lamech, again, an impressive figure. You were introduced to him in chapter nine, uh, 4, verse 19, all the way to 24. He gets a lot of ink. He's an impressive figure. He's a king. He's powerful. He's the father of these three sons, and, and we're told that these sons accomplished much. They produced much. They achieved much. But Lamech is ungodly. It's ungodly. That's what it comes down to. And now who's the seventh from Adam in Seth's line? That's seventh from Adam in Cain's line. But the seventh from Adam in Seth's line is Enoch. Enoch, uh, in the middle of chapter 5 there, verses 21 through 24. Enoch is the man who lived. With Enoch, the pattern is broken. We don't get this end. He died. Look at verse 23 with me. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. No end, he died. And you say, well, I thought everyone had to die. I thought the book of Romans says that the wages of sin is death, that in Adam all men die. I thought that, that Hebrews 9, verse 27, says that it is for all men to die once and then to face judgment. How come he didn't die? I say, yes, that's true. Those verses are true. That thinking is true and correct, but we do want to be careful not to be too systematic in our thinking. And trust me, I enjoy doing that with the best of them. We, we have to con control ourselves, remind ourselves not to be too systematic in our thinking. Because in history, not every person or not every situation fits neatly into our system of doctrine, even though that system is true and biblical and right. But God places extraordinary exceptions before us, and he does that for a purpose. He does that for a purpose. That's important. And Enoch is one of these exceptions. Hebrews 11, verse 5, famous chapter, Hebrews 11, by faith, says that by faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. He said, why did God do this? How is this possible? Because he walked with God. Twice we are told that in these short verses. He walked with God. He had an intimate relationship with God. And so rather than died, he lived. To Enoch to live was to walk with God. And so he's walking with him now, even to this day. What's the take-home message for you and me? What are we supposed to take from this? Is it, be like Enoch and you will live? That's not good news. That's not the gospel. That's the law. Do this and live. Be like him and you'll live. Because the reality is we don't fully walk with God and we all sin in different ways and yet we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Do you believe that? It's true. And so as we, as, if we were to say this, there would be no assurance, there would be no comfort in this demand, this, this command to be like Enoch and you will live. So what's the, what's the message for us? Well, to get at it, let's ask this question. 
What is the key contrast between the line of Cain and the line of Seth? The key contrast, if we could sum it up. And the answer is found in this, in what is emphasized about them. What is emphasized about them? Because what is emphasized about the line of Cain? It's cultural and technological progress and achievements. They're metal workers, they're ranchers, they're musicians. And we would say these are all good things, right? But they're missing something essential. Again, they're ungodly. There's no glory given to God. There's no trust put in God. We saw this last week. No mention of God at all. But rather, they're all about themselves. Their trust is in themselves. But what about Seth's line? Seth's line has faith. Chapter 4, verse 26, the last verse there, we read that they began to call on the name of the Lord. They're calling on him. And now in chapter 5, we see that especially in the words of Lamech. This one will comfort us, this one being the seed that God has given to him. You see, Lamech looks back into the past and he understands as he refers to the ground being cursed, he understands that sin is the root of their trouble and their toil. He acknowledges that. But then he looks forward into the future and he anticipates God's work, not his own work, like the line of Cain, but God's work to provide comfort and salvation through his offspring, through the seed of the woman. So the end result, brothers and sisters, is this. That God will build his city through the godly Lamech's son. Not through the ungodly Lamech's sons, even though they're busy building the city of man. Well, what do we respond to this with? How, how do we apply this to our lives, to our situations? Again, to our perspective on life. Brothers and sisters, guests, Boys and girls, understand that progress is good. Achievement is good. To strive for excellence is a good thing. To have goals in your career, that's a good thing. Children, perhaps you don't have a career. You think, how does this apply to me? Well, to pursue music is a good thing. To, to want to be good at it. To play sports and to desire to be the best you can be at sports. These are great things. But, is this achievement what matters in the end? No! It's not what matters. What matters is whether we are people of faith. That's what defines you and me. Whether we are people of faith. You see, the interesting thing about Enoch... Not only do we not get the achievements of this whole list of people in the line of Seth, but, but Enoch lived shorter than everybody else in this chapter. The most godly figure, but he lived his shortest. See, it's not about worldly achievements. This shows us that to be with God, to be in his presence, is a better thing by far. And we know that Paul uses that language. He says it's better to be with him by far. To die, in fact, Paul says, is gain. It's all gain. And yet we understand that we're called to live. This is not a call to put ourselves to death or anything like that. We're called by God to live this life. And so to live, Paul says, is Christ. And so for us to reflect on this then through this passage, we understand that all our pursuits, all our achievements, they matter only insofar as we are developing the talents that God has given us. And we are enjoying the life that God has given us to His honor and to His glory in Christ. We must look to Christ, brothers and sisters, in faith. By faith. The faith that Enoch had. Enoch had this faith. Enoch didn't look to himself and to his own achievements, but he looked outside of himself to another. To God. And so God gives us Enoch here, not as some kind of tricky question that we should be stumped over. Why didn't he die? But as an illustration. Because you see, Enoch's life foreshadows for you and for me the resurrection and eternal life that comes to all who trust in Jesus. Who confess him as Savior and Lord. So put your trust in him. 
Again, we live this life and you see death all around you. You see war across the world. If you read anything or see any news videos, you know that there's war in this world in various places. You see violence in our city, if we have the eyes to see it. Also in our region, but close to home. We see death in hospital beds. We see death even in the world, the creation around us, the, the animals and the vegetation. There is change and decay, we could say, in all around I see. That's the, that's the words of abide with me, right? Change and decay in all around I see. So with that, we need to turn to God in faith, turn to Christ, to find your comfort and your hope in Him so that you continue that song and say, O oh God who changes not, abide with me. Abide with me. It's that the voice of faith sings that. So abide with Him, brothers and sisters. Guess. Abide with Him. Turn to Him. Find your life in Him. Believe in Him. And then you will receive comfort and blessing greater than all the blessings of this life. A comfort that's strong enough for this life and death. The comfort that you are not your own, but that you belong to Him. Look to Him, your faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And then though you die, you will live forever in glory with Him. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, Father in heaven, we, we all desire life. And we know that you created us for life. And yet through our sin, through the sin of our first father, Adam, in whom we all are represented, in whom we all were guilty, death came to this world. And yet, Lord, we are so thankful for your son, Jesus Christ. We're so thankful for the second Adam the one in whom life comes to all who are in him, to all whom he represents, to all whom he stands for. And we thank you that he is our advocate in heaven even now, promoting our cause before you, defending us, standing before you, so that when you look at us, you do not see our sin and our weakness, but you see his righteousness. If we have repented of our sins and put our faith in him. Lord, help us.